Feel Good is probably the most durable of all British R&B bands. They formed in the early 1970s and their music, while still blues-based, is characterised by their hard-driving rock approach. Dr. Feel Good have been the backbone of British R&B for ten years. They emerged in the early 70s, playing their then unfashionable brand of music at a time when rock was preoccupied with glitter and extravagance. 90% of it was old material, and it wasn't even all strict R&B. We used to put in sort of old rock and roll songs as well for good measure, because we were playing in pubs and we wanted to wanted to please our audience, you know, to, to attract their attention for at least half the time. We'd play sort of old Buddy Holly songs. We were taken notice of because of the, our weird appearance, our very ordinary appearance. You know, we weren't sort of dressing up in any particular clothes or anything. We were just finishing work and getting up to London quick and playing the gigs. I think that's maybe why people started to take notice of us because of our strange appearance and a very unfashionable type of music. Oh, come on, everybody, let's get together tonight. I've got some money in my jeans and a break of a spending to ride. Right. I've been doing my whole life long. Now I've sent you my hotel goals. In 1973, the sound of the self-indulgent progressive rock bands was being challenged by hard-hitting rhythm and blues outfits. One of these groups was Canvey's Dr. Feelgood. We saw Dr. Feelgood. It really struck us because this seemed to be uh, uh, plugging in, plugging into that whole maximum r and beating again. And it had a certain, uh, it had a certain discipline to it, a certain uh, aggression. You can make a case of, for, for that whole area as, as being important musically, you know. It had the uh, the Detroit connection with the Falls Motor Works, you know. It had the Mississippi connection being on the Thames Delta. And it had, uh, it had a shed load of attitude. Yeah, let's go. She let that mouth, she let it go. I'm a dad, I'm a 
they were like a junior feel goods. They looked a bit like the feel goods. They played harmonica driven R&B style uh, music, even a bit faster than the feel goods. So they were Dr. Feelgood for, for the kids. Well, the Hot Rods, uh, I first became aware of them through buying the Live at the Marquee EP. Again, read about them a lot in the music papers. And uh, they were doing something really revolutionary. I mean, me and my mates were, were, were playing the sort of songs that were on the Live at the Marquee EP. We were playing Gloria, but we were playing it like them. You know, we were playing quite slow. Hearing Eddie and the Hot Rods playing it at 100 miles an hour, just electrifying. The whole phrase punk rock came from these kind of English garage bands like Eddie and the Hot Rod and the Feel Goods, playing songs like Wooly Bully by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, who was one of the original American what was called punk bands. I mean, that's where the name come from. It wasn't from the Sex Pistols or from the Damned. It was actually from from the the Hot Rods. Uh, and I think although they never looked like punks, and their subsequent career really didn't um, ex express itself in what we might call traditional punk way. You could argue that Eddie and the Hot Rods were the very first punk band. This whole idea that punk came out of Malcolm McLaren's, you know, mind is, is tosh really. It was invented in Essex, as everyone knows. Eddie and the Hot Rods weren't the only Essex band to influence the punk scene. Most punk bands that got away uh, had definitely seen Dr. Feelgood. And I think the thing probably that they got from Dr. Feelgood was, was uh, the, the, the whole idea of just of just simplicity and, and energy and, and and violence really I don't think that that audience would have been so ready to accept the pistols and the clash and the damned had the feel goods not have said you can play short snappy numbers you can play fast you can have short hair and you can jump about like a maniac two larger-than-life characters who'd made a living knocking down doors in the pub rock scene. Jake Riviera was a short-tempered firebrand who got fed up playing by the rules. When not poking people in the eye, he managed Nick Lowe and Dr. Feelgood. I was managing Nick Lowe and he didn't have a record deal. I thought I could do a better job on my own. And then Dave Robinson was uh, living, with, was going out with my flatmate. And he was managing Grant Parker, and he said, well, why don't we do it together? The major record companies really had very little attitude to anything that was different to what they themselves fancied. We decided that a record company was the way forward.
Dave provided the business premises, which also handily doubled as his squad. And Jake provided the dosh by hustling alone out of Dr. Feelgood's lead singer. Lee Brillo said to me, uh, oh, you're starting your own label. How much is that going to cost him? I said, oh, I reckon it's going to be like 400 quid, you know, to get it going. And he just whipped out his checkbook, wrote me out a check, gave me the check. God bless him. Is she really going out with him? Yes. 
Okay, we're ready when when you want me. Thank you. Yeah. That's a Manhattan transfer in Tuxedo Junction. You want the original? Here's Glenn Miller. <laughs> you see that I want to be adored more than you'll ever know. And I'm going overboard with the capital O. So don't be persistent. Please keep your distance. You know my resistance is low. Something daring, the continental A way of dancing that's really ultra new It's very subtle, the continental Because it does what you want it to do It has a passion, the continental An invitation to moonlight and romance It's quite the fashion, the continental because you tell of your love while you dance Someone's rocking my dream boat Someone's invading my dreams We were sailing along So peaceful and calm Suddenly something went wrong Someone's rocking my dream boat Someone's invading my dreams It's a mystery to me This mutiny at sea Who could it be? Who could it be? Bobby. the number one sound of the nation last week at number three this week at the number one position for the fantastic manhattan transfer company and their chanson de moore
always a delight to see Manhattan transfer on top of the pops. And here they are in full regalia with their new single on a little street in Singapore. Guess who just got back today? Rent a Santa. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. Oh yes! But this year, he's traded in his reindeer for a motorbike. Hey Santa, how do you get around so fast? All you gotta do is wiggle your little head. And where are you going now? Oh my goodness, there's been a terrible accident. What are we going to do without Father Christmas? Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic Santa. But who can perform such an operation? We are going over now to the House of Commons. Here, both major parties are in full agreement over the financing of a bionic operation. And Jim Callahan and Margaret Thatcher have issued the following statement. Everyone is asking Mrs. Thatcher... Is that Jimmy's ring you're wearing? But not everyone is happy. Some conservatives are saying to their leader... Well, you can't like it. But what has Mrs. Thatcher done now? She's left Janet's face. Now Mr. Callahan is saying to Mrs. Thatcher... Oh, Maggie, I wish I'd never seen your face. Mrs. Thatcher is saying to Jim Callahan... Jim Dirty Dog. And now fighting has broken out in the house. Roll up my the speaker do something if the boys want to fight you better let them we return you now to the peace and quiet of the bionic laboratory and here the operation has been a great success tell us santa how do you feel Brand new. we all know steve austin has a bionic eye jamie summers has a bionic ear what is your special bionic feature? My ding -a -ling -a -ling. Well, it's almost Christmas. And Santa, it's time you were on your way. Here I go again. Oi! How much longer is this record going on? Forever, ever, 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 ever,
What's your name? What's your name? You've been causing trouble a lot in my club. What's your name? Oh, never, I don't cause trouble. We talked about. Do we cause trouble? Yes, you cause trouble. No, we don't. Yes, you do. Oh no, we don't. When you get that big belly, and what is your name? Hill. Hill. You're over it. Introduce the next act. You with me? No. You ready? No. Are we gonna go? No. Hi, tension. <laughs>
let's do it with the Woo Woo. All right, Mr. Woo Woo is back in town. Oh, Tim Rose. 
girlfriends. Posers, go and find your girlfriends, because you're such big posers, you have no trouble pulling women. films. Let's have a line dance. Right, the Dimno Shuffle. Let's do the Dimno Shuffle. Come on, get in a line.
Oh, so I was a soul boy, so I was wearing like, um, it was sort of like Canby Island, The Lacey Lady, it was soul music. So it was that like Cobra from America with Hawaiian shirts, plastic sandals, you know, sort of chinos. It was kind of quite beautiful. Good evening, welcome to the gold mine, Canby Island, where tonight we've got some of the most exciting bands from London town. All you need is the price of admission and the smartest clothes you can find. You lot are definitely not coming in. We've also got, just behind you, some members of a Paddington Soul Tribe. Now, how many times a week do you go out? A couple, two. About once or twice a week at the weekends. And do you go to all the different soul clubs, or do you have one favourite one? Well, we mainly like the gold mines, our main club up in Canby Island. Mm. And what's the appeal of somewhere like that? Chris Hill, mainly, and entertainment that he gets. But with you, why do you go out? Do you get drunk? No, I don't drink anymore. What do you do? Do we just go there for the music to dance. Really? You don't hang around the seawall? Nah, that's not our scene. Oh, that was last season thing. Oh dear. And you lot, what are you planning to do? You must be, because with the soul clubs, there's always lots of trips, like going to, well, exotic countries. And with not much time, we've got to go into now a video which shows that hideous armpit, Canvey Island, which isn't really the hotbed of musical sin that you'd imagine. It's more of, well, a little club at the end of a pier with fairy lights outside but well it is also a hotbed of musical sin and you can tell by the clientele they get there <laughs> also don't have pints to drink on the dance floor because i don't want to see people getting hit with pints to drink there's beer going everywhere right? so the dance floor is for dancers all right the bar is for drinkers we got all the drinkers at the bar have we serious drinking that night there right? Very good, very good. There's also that element of danger that the fact that the petrol, ke petrochemical terminal might explode at any minute. And we're actually below sea level, so we're actually, there's this sort of uh, element that the whole thing could end tomorrow, you know, we could all get killed in some catastrophe. What do you think that, um, you think that they like the thought of living dangerously in Canby? Yeah, I think that that's what, uh, that's what these kind of... It's the about. sparkling glamour yeah. of Canby, yes. Yeah. What, what do you think the main difference is, though, with a club like this? than, say, somewhere that's far more glamorous, like the Palace or the Beetroot in London? Well, those places um, cater for a totally different type of audience. I mean, we're, the audience that, that comes to the gold mine is an audience that is a committed musical audience. I mean, it sounds very high-blown, but it is a committed musical audience. They, they're into soul music. They're not into current musical trends. They're into the, the contemporary black music of that day, plus the kind of rootsy black stuff of the last 10 years. Do you think if most people who go to an ordinary club came here, they'd recognise any of the records? Probably not, not when they came here, but it's interesting that a lot of records we play here eventually become chart records. But by the same token, a lot of the people who come to these clubs, like they have coach loads, I think it's, it's important that it's not just different people each week, it's often the same people, yeah. same cliques of people, and they come just to see you. So what do you think makes you different to any other DJ? And also more famous than, say, DJs that are on the radio? 
and richer than people <laughs> from the radio. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. If the text man's watching, it's not true. That's absolutely not true. Um, I don't know. I think it's just that we're successful and that I've been successful. What do you do then? Um, it's different for somebody who's never seen you blowing your I whistle I along with say. records. No, I can't say what, it, what, what I do is different. I'm, I'm do my job professionally. Do you not um, think that, say, people might find it odd to go to a club where the DJ sings backing vocals with the records? Uh, How did you start doing that? It just because I got bored just playing the records, I wanted to contribute. So you, you know, you, if you when, you, when you're working up there, I mean, that is the point. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm putting on a performance, yeah. if you like, as well with the records. Oh! other kinds of music or are you only inter interested in the sort of thing you find here? I'm only interested in this sort of thing. Mm. Would you like go specially just to see say Chris? Not so much just to see the DJ basically because the music he plays not just because it's him. Mm. He's coming over now, he's going to beat your head in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be able to hear them on next standing up. <laughs> Was that what happened? Oh, I didn't like to mention it. But um, all these clubs, do you go all around the country to different ones or do you just come here all the time? Ah, oh, we go around to different clubs around the country because uh, in a sort of way, they're not owned by the same owners but there's a good relationship between you know, the same sort of clubs, you get the same type of people who go there who we know, we'll see them down here tonight, mm -hmm. we may see them 60 or 70 miles away. But yeah. you do it in, in sort of, in what you would call tribes, don't you? Yeah. And how many are there in most of the tribes? Well they vary, you can have um, ranges from uh, two or three people in a tribe. A so small tribe? Well, an yeah, you could call tribe. them a small tribe, yeah. <laughs> to 60 or 70 people in the tribe. And uh, the thing that they've all got in common, they're all friends. Uh, everyone respects each other and gets on with each other. And do you have any violence, things like that? Violence, well, only when you're trying to get to the bar. They all, they all sort of come from the, the same sort of local area and they just grab an image. I mean, you've got like, the black kidneys, you know, I mean, you've got, they used to have a tribe called the Bananas. I mean, their t-shirts used to have bananas all over them. What's the Brixton frontline were? Well, I mean, you know, the front line sort of relates to a sort of military type image. I mean, we, we would normally go around in military type gear, you know, you know green sort of khaki t-shirts and things like that. How about the stiffest sex maniacs? Uh, well, I think that one sort of speaks for itself, really. You know, what I mean, they wear? They'll, they'll, they'll have uh, saxes all over themselves and they might change the sex into sex, maybe, you know, it's that sort of thing. Oh, um, do you think there are any particularly glamorous tribes or do you think it just doesn't appeal to people to try and be glamorous? I think everybody's trying to be famous. Everyone's trying to be one up on you know everybody else, really. And what makes one tribe better from another, apart from the fact you might be a member of it? Um, I don't think there is like one tribe that's better than any other. I mean, I suppose that time will tell. Those that last the longest will be the best. A lot of the people that come here come here for long, long periods of time. I mean, they, I call them, I refer to them maybe as kids, but I mean, it's, it's a joke. Because a lot of them are forty. A lot of them are oh. perhaps not forty. Aging rapidly. But but aging rapidly. And still I'm still coming, I'm still coming down here. Chris Hill was just the first, well not only did he have an incredible passion and for the music and, and great taste in terms of the records he played, but
but he was a phenomenon as a performer. I mean, it just no, I'd never seen anything like it, and I, th I, I still think to this day, you know, we haven't really seen many people. Although the scene has obviously, you know, evolved and changed so much in terms of performance, um, I've, there's very few people I've come across that was were as sort of individual, unique as, as he was. I mean, he, he would sing along with the records. Sound kind of odd now, but. You know, he he just, would, you know, he was a proper pop star, really. You know, he had, he had every, everybody in the room in the palm of his hand, you know. The real end of the soul scene for me was walking into Shum. I mean, I can absolutely vividly remember that night. And walking, I mean, I remember walking into Shum in whatever that would have been, 86 or whatever it is, as someone who had still, through their heart, been a soul boy all the way through. I walked into Shum in a Gautier suit. Having come from the WAG club, I'd gone from the WAG to Shum, crossed the river, and suddenly here was all these slum boys on E in, in baggy lilac clothes, dancing to music that was sounded like it was made by metronomes, and I just remember thinking, that's it for me. Go out.